Hey everyone, my name is Ali Malik. I'm one of the interventional radiology attendings at St. Louis University Hospital. So I've been an IR attending uh, since 2018. Um, that's when I finished my fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and uh, I did my residency training in Miami at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Um, and I worked for about a year in Miami after fellowship doing outpatient interventional radiology. And then I decided to join uh, a busy, a very busy academic center here in St. Louis. And it's been a very exciting uh, journey uh, so far. And uh, the best thing about academic interventional radiology is being able to work with uh, uh, medical students, and residents, and uh, you know, seeing a, a really wide variety of cases. Um, the good thing about uh, you know, being in an academic center also is that you get to see a lot of the complex cases too, which you may not see in the outpatient setting as much. All right, so why don't we go inside and see what kind of cases we got lined up for the day. So our, our typical day in interventional radiology starts at 7.15 in the morning. So we'll get here earlier, get our patients ready for the day. Um, and at 7.15, we round uh, do quick imaging and chart rounds to go over the case list for the day. And once we have a plan for everyone, um, then one of us, one of the attendings will go upstairs and round on patients that need to be seen. And uh, once we're done with uh, floor rounds, then we go into our cases during the day. You know, typical case mix for a day, you know, at a level one trauma center and a transplant center could include anything from, you know, traumas, bleeds um, in the hospital, uh, PEs, DVTs, um, in addition to our outpatient scheduled oncology procedures like Y90s, TASES, ablations. Uh, we have a dedicated CT scanner, so we end up doing a lot of uh, image guided ablations there. And, uh, you know, the rest of uh, hospital-based interventional procedures. All right, so let's go over the CT angio chest of our PE consult. So uh, here we can see, let's find the pulmonary arteries. So you can see in the pulmonary arteries, you have a nice saddle embolus. And in fact, if you look at the um, right main, distal main pulmonary artery, you can see that the clot uh, is extending there and it's also extending to the left side. So um, there's a you know, significant clot burden in the distal main pulmonary arteries bilaterally with extension into the descending uh, uh, branches. And in fact, this patient uh, not only has a saddle PE, but they also have evidence of right heart strain. So the right ventricle is dilated compared to the left ventricle. So therefore this would be um, in addition to their biomarker elevation, uh, their elevated troponins, elevated BNP, um, as well as lactate. Um, so this person uh, is categorized as a submassive PE. And so for this uh, person, you know, who continues to have increasing oxygen requirements in the ED, uh, despite being on anticoagulation since they came in, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead with pulmonary uh, thrombectomy um, and uh, see how she does after the procedure. So here we're looking at the um, angiogram of the pulmonary arteries and you can see that there are some filling defects on the left side and uh, filling defects on the right side as well, more so than the left and you can see that the overall perfusion to the right lung is decreased. Um, and uh, the mean pulmonary pressures were, you know, somewhat elevated um, at around 25. So uh, let's see uh, how she does after the thrombectomy. This is what the pulmonary arteries look like post thrombectomy. You can see that the upper lobes are, are pacifying, upper lobe branch is pacifying much better. In addition to the lower lobes, the filling defects on the left side um, you know, are, are also um, no longer present. But I think um, to really appreciate how much clot came out, uh, we're gonna have to take a look at the actual clot. So let's go take a look at that.
All right, let's take a look at this case that came through the door. Um, this is a patient, it's a young patient who has, um, you know, acute alcoholic hepatitis. Um, and she, you know, has worsening liver function and she uh, got a three-phase liver CT and you can see that her portal vein is quite diminutive with portal venous thrombus and that thrombus extends into her splenic vein as well. Her splenic veins uh, actually hard to visualize because it, because it is also um, on the smaller side and in addition she has quite um, a few gastric varices so not much in terms of esophageal varices but a but a lot of gastric varices and you know these are uh, uh, what we would call you know gastric fundal varices isolated gastric varices that uh, were contributing to her symptoms and so what did she come in with she came in with hematemesis um, and in fact her hemoglobin was four when she came in um, or she was starting to become hemodynamically unstable they were not able to control the bleeding on endoscopy so uh, this is where IRs consulted for a possible tips now you you could try to do the tips with such a diminutive portal vein with some portal venous thrombus but what we're going to do is in the acute setting with such a low hemoglobin she's very young she does not have documented um, cirrhosis um, what we're going to do is we're going to embolize these varices and uh, try to redirect the blood flow towards the liver see if that'll improve the portal venous and splenic venous patency um, and then decide if uh, if a tips is needed after that um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that procedure. All right, so what we're doing here is we are trying to get into the portal vein via transhepatic route. So it looks like we have um, entered the portal venous system. What we need to do is get into the main portal vein. So let's take a look at that. All right, now our wire is in the main portal vein. And here you can see that, you know, um, there's some portal venous thrombus. Look at how diminutive the splenic vein is here because of thrombus here as well. She's not really a good candidate for a, a retrograde venous obliteration at this point, but if we can acutely control these gastric varices with a large gastrorenal shunt, um, this can help stabilize her and then um, potentially even improve her portosplenic patency. So. Let's take a look at some of those pictures. Um, and so here now uh, we have cannulated the uh, gastric varices via transhepatic route. And you can see very large varices with a large gastrorenal shunt there. And that's the renal vein. That's the shunt emptying into the renal vein. Um, and that's going into the IVC there. Okay. And so let's see uh, how it looks like once we start coiling. This is what it looks like post coiling. So, of course, you know when when you close off one of the varices, um, a couple more can pop up. So what we'll do is we'll put a small plug there. Um, so here we decide to use a, a small amplatz or four plug. Let's get a better picture of these um, varices. There you go, you got a nice little plug there. And uh, let's see uh, how she does. All right, so here's a three months uh, follow-up CT triple phase of the same patient. You can see our coils in place. Um, the feeding gastric varices are, uh, are, are smaller, certainly, but the gastrorenal shunt is still patent. Um, but, if you look at the portal vein, that looks um, a lot better than it did before. And in fact, now you can trace a patent splenic vein as well. You can see it a little bit better on the venous phase here. So you can see a nice portal vein. You know, it, it, it is no longer diminutive. Um, it does not have uh, the same degree of clot burden anymore. In fact, it's almost completely resolved and there's a nice splenic vein as well. Um, and in fact, since then, she has um, 
you know, lost some weight and she has completely quit drinking and um, feels better uh, than before. Um, she has no, she has had no further episodes of hematemesis or bleeding per rectum. Um, so not only did the anti-grade embolization stabilize her in the acute setting, it actually redirected the blood flow to the portal vein um, and to her liver um, and, and all of her liver function tests actually improved um, on the three month follow up. So this is great. This gives us options. You know, if she has another episode of bleeding, she could be a candidate of for uh, either retrograde transvenous obliteration or a TIPS procedure uh, if needed because she uh, now has a good anatomy for both of those procedures and hopefully she'll need neither. Why did I decide to do interventional radiology? Well, I was a first year resident and at that time I, I was still open to, to uh, you know, different specialties in radiology, but my first interventional radiology rotation kind of sealed the deal for me. So, uh, you know, uh, that was with uh, a great group of seniors and, uh, you know, we were doing uh, uh, all the complex um, aortic work uh, above the knee, below the knee, advanced revascularizations, um, in addition to kind of the rest of the interventional radiology spectrum. So. That early exposure to vascular interventional radiology was uh, very, very instrumental in my decision to pursue IR. And then since then, I went to SIR, I went to ISET, and just seeing kind of the community that IR has become, um, you know, uh, across the country and really now across the world uh, was so inspiring and uh, just never looked back since then.